Hi guys, this is Andrew Fischel, and I'm here with David Duville, a Sabre coach from Atlanta, Cornell Udvarheli, a, an Epe coach from FC, and Alex Martin, a foil coach from FC, who's impressed that I got Cornell's name right. And, uh, <laughs> no kidding. Sort of. <laughs> sort of. And today we're going uh, to be talking about how to make fencing more watchable or spectator friendly. And uh, so just a quick intro to the three weapons. I think in general, it's it's like widely accepted that Sabre is the most like watchable or spectator friendly, but the hardest to understand. Epe is the least spectator friendly, but the easiest to understand. And foil is somewhere in the middle, depending on the kind of bout. So <laughs> let's just get started. Fair enough. All right. <laughs> what do you guys think are ways to make fencing more watchable? Let me let me get started with uh, it's something that I think is very important and uh, unfortunately experienced it uh, since I'm I became the national coach a few years ago and I'm traveling for, to all the World Cups. One of the things that I I really want to see that uh, the International uh, Fencing Federation should absolutely enforce it at every single at least senior World Cup level uh, has to go on YouTube. Mm-hmm. Let's say we've been to a couple of tournaments, it's hard to find it, or it's not even uh, on YouTube at all, even if they have the video review and it would be not a rocket science, I think, to hook it up to the internet to make sure that everybody can watch it. That's one thing. That, that, that'd be, that should be a must, no yes, question. Yes, I agree. If somebody can't get it done, should not uh, be awarded uh, with a World Cup, period. The second thing is what uh, I experienced a lot of times when I was trying to watch something from home, especially, uh, uh, obviously, since I was on the Senior Men's Epe World Cups, I'm talking about other weapons or uh, competitions that I didn't attend, like the European Championships, let's say, right? The other day, I sat down to look at the European uh, Junior Championships, and I look at the schedule, okay, 10 minutes after 6 o'clock, they have the Women's Epe Final, I want to check it out. I sit down 10 minutes after 6 o'clock, I turn it on, award ceremony already. <laughs> so, so literally, they have to do a much better job to do the bats as they uh, schedule. Yeah. Because right now, they even those home spectators who would like to watch some things, they're going to be like pissed and, you know what, this is crazy. I'm just going to watch it later, you know, at some point. Or maybe because of that, they not even get to watch it. They want to watch something in live. I think more, way more exciting to watch it, the video live, and you don't know what the outcome is. And uh, but it has to be strict to the schedule. I understand in the World Cups they have the rule that uh, you know they can start depending on how things finish, like 10, 15 minutes earlier. Yeah. But I would still try to follow as best I can. Or when they post in the times online, they should say we might start. 10 minutes earlier, but not earlier than 10 minutes earlier. And in this case, people know, okay, if I want to watch Novosiel Fencing with uh, with Borel at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, okay, 3.10 I have to sit down, I have to turn it on, and whatever happens, happens. But when I sit down and the thing is over, there is nothing worse than that. It's basically when you try to catch a bus, you get there 3 minutes early, the bus left 5 minutes early. No. <laughs> it's ridiculous. No, it's they, true. We can't, our sport can't afford that because we know that it's not as spectator friendly as of now, and even the spectators we have, we're not serving them properly. Yeah, that's the minimum they should have. I've and been, then after that, obviously, we can talk about other things. I've been at tournaments between rounds, like going to get a sandwich or something, and I I come back and I find that even though the start time is at four o'clock, it's three fifty-five and the bouts are halfway over, and exactly. it's space saber is even more. Well, yeah, athletes are dealing with the same thing. Right? Yes, exactly. So that's- yeah, that's not just a spectator problem. That's that's a problem for the the fencers as well. So yeah, so having them having the schedule more closely adhered to when they're broadcasting, making sure that they're broadcasting at all, and then broadcasting in a place where people can find it. Like sometimes, sometimes I get I get tons of requests when a tournament is going on. Like where can I find this footage? And usually, if you YouTube it and you poke around for a while, you can find it. But like, why isn't it more advertised where it is? Exactly. So. It should be front page FI website every weekend. Here are these weekend, these weekend tournaments broadcast. This World Cup, this World Cup, this. And you just click and you're right there on YouTube. And you that would watch be so much easier. Foil, yeah. Sabre, Epi, Junior, Senior, whatever they have, 
should yeah. be right on the, on the on the front page, basically. Yeah, totally. What about you guys? Any other? Well, I thought about sorry. Uh, I I thought about this from the perspective of like what would make me because I'm a foil guy. What would make me want to watch a saber or an epe bout? Like what what would be really attractive about that to me? And I was thinking back to this belt that you posted, Andrew, from the European Championships between, um, there was a Romanian guy. Kiratoli uh, and Zalamir. Yeah, and uh, Kiratoli, right? Is that uh, right? Yes, it is. And uh, we at the World Championships in Budapest last year, I was showing that video to, like, all these different people, and every single person has an opinion on that, right? Yeah. It was totally out of line. It wasn't out of line. It was justified. It was the referee's fault. It was the fencer's fault. It was whatever, right? There, and there's outrageous behavior from both sides, like after, after the bout and everything. And everyone was talking about it for like 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 an hour. There was like like everyone wanted to say their piece on it. And I think like what it showed me is that, um, and especially with background, especially when a saber fencer can be like, yeah, this guy's known for this kind of stuff. He's all these kind of antics, whatever, and. Um, one way or the other, it like polarizes that person to you, right? So you're like, either I want to see this guy lose or I want to see this guy win. And <clears throat> when you do that, you create so much more buzz around it. So if you told me those two guys are going to fence again, Alex, and you can watch it, like you said, it's, it's streamlined so I can watch it at 6 p.m., I will tune in and watch that. Because I know that these guys are going to be going into the belt, remembering what happened last time and having some kind of... And then if you really wanted to make it good... I think you would interview both of them and ask them about the last boat and say, hey, what did you think of the crap that guy pulled in the last boat? Or did you think the refereeing was fair or whatever? Yeah, dredge and up the drama. stir up this, this, like, this like buzz and, and, and um, excitement about it. And I think fencing in general, we kind of tend to reject that because we, we want to be like honorable purists and like super polite to each other and everything like that. It's a gentleman's but sport. I look at other sports and like, Man, who, who wasn't excited about uh, Floyd Mayweather fighting Conor McGregor? Or who wasn't excited about, like, these these polarizing personalities? You watch them maybe because you want them to win, or you just want to see them lose. lose like, yeah, totally. Like, you watch them. What about that's you, my, David? That's my answer. We need to tap into people's personalities. Yeah, yeah. We yeah. have a lot of interesting personalities, defensive, and we don't, we don't get enough of them, I don't think. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I think that um, I think that personality does play a large part into it, and I think that one of the things that needs to be kind of touched on, and it can create a unique opportunity too for somebody, is you know if you look at Andrew, the like because you played Smash right right before the rise of esports, and the whole rise of esports was kind of ushered in by the commentator personalities, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's the commentator's job to, to hype kind it up. of briefly express what's going on for mm -hmm. those who don't know and then hype up situations you know if you're listening to a commentator and someone's making a great attack and they're going oh this is a great attack yes this person is known for great attacks like no people that don't understand the sport they're not going to know that they're supposed to get excited about that yeah. but if you know Sengoku is marching down the strip to make an attack and someone makes him short at the end and the commentator's going and he pulled him short you know and he's they're just getting them hyped then now the people that are involved in watching it, they know to be excited too, even if they don't necessarily know what they're excited about. And then you take that a step further, you know, and you take that person and you have them kind of be um, almost almost this community manager type of person because the, the fencing community is pretty small. And, you know, with the kind of way that people are using social media now and, you know, the Instagram and the Twitter and stuff like that, uh, there's a big opportunity to create interactions between people who wouldn't normally interact with each other. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's the first thing is to kind of create this united front, right? And then from there, expand outwards. Uh, I also think that, you know, the commentator is really important because if you look at the other sports that are really spectator friendly, like, um, let's say, basketball, football, baseball, boxing, you know, UFC, um, they're they're spectator friendly because they're really dumbed down. There's a very like to UFC for example. There's a level of intricacy to the sport that people who understand it enjoy watching. But at the core, it's just one dude trying to beat up another dude. 
and you know if that's going their way or not. So yeah. you don't you don't have to know a lot to watch it. And I think that uh, it's important for us to find ways to kind of bring that simplicity to the people who don't understand the sport without watering down the sport in of itself. You know, when they tried to change the timing uh, so that all of the touches were more one light mm-hmm. uh, than sock two lights, uh, which, by the way, was the only time I ever finished you, Andrew, and I just keep, I keep forgetting to slap you, but just remind me <laughs> next time I see you. God, do. stupid <laughs> counterattacks. But, um, <laughs> you know, that was, that was an attempt at making it more spectator friendly and and they did make it easier to tell who got the touch but there were a lot of people in the sport that were not happy with it so i think there's a way that you bring the sport to people that don't understand it without upsetting people that do understand it if that makes any sense yeah totally i think something uh, go ahead so basically i agree with this and uh it's many times it's, it's the, the hard part coming from, from basically our community, as, as David pointed it out. I remember in, the, in 2015 at the World Championships, we had a, on a team event. Uh, back then was a different possibility rule in Epe, and uh, Germany beat Poland to make the top eight, five, four as a final score. They had nine possibilities, literally going through nine bats, even the last bat, they did possibility. One minute of fencing. One light in the first 15 seconds, and then nothing for 40 seconds or 30 seconds. In the last 15 seconds, they had four more doubles, and that was it. So <laughs> immediately after the tournament, I called my friend uh, Christian Fulchar, who, is, who was the sports director at FIE, and uh, I said, listen, we got to do something. we got to do something because, let's be honest to ourselves, fencing is not a team sport, okay? Team fencing is great, and it's super exciting if it's done right. If people go there and they do what they signed up for, it's fencing, right? But if you don't do something, they're just going to say, listen, this is not a team sport anyway. And they're not just going to scratch men's epi. They're going to scratch huh, team fencing. They don't need it. Individuals, you know? And it's going to be devastating because uh, so many people are not going to have a chance to go to the Olympics then, let's say. Mm-hmm. So that's when they started thinking what the change would be. And actually, they were talking about in epi also to, to shorten the time what you need for the double touches, which might give a little more advantage of the offensive actions. That would mean people would more likely to attack than sit back and do nothing and just wait and make counterattacks because now it's way more beneficial. But unfortunately, they never actually tested this. You think by shortening the timing, it would make people want to attack more? And I'm not sure, but I believe if you attack me and I can produce the double touches all the time, that means I'm reacting to you. It's I still have enough time to react to you, right? Mm. So if we shorten the time, we might see that, okay, the attack would land just a little bit earlier than that, and it's not enough time to make the double touch. Maybe. I'm not 100%, but it's. I think it would be worth to try and give a little more advantage to, to the attacks. Although, you never know, maybe it would become kind of like Sabre. Everybody would just want to go forward. Maybe it wouldn't be good, but I never seen a real test on this. But uh, I <laughs> feel like the machine would be terrible. <laughs> yeah, the machine, the machine is not available where you can change the timing like like a yeah. little bit of press of a button. Yeah, and should test that out and see what would be like on the API side this way. And when I called Christian about this, actually, he told me that I'm happy that you called me, and 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 I'm happy that somebody is finally open minded because. Most of the people, they know. They don't want to change because this is the nature of Epi and whatever. I'm like, yeah, but they got to understand. We want to keep this as an Olympic sport. We want to make it spectator friendly, you know, to make it more enjoyable and watchable. You can't put it on the Olympic final for an hour uh, window on the TV and they actually see one minute of fencing, Yeah, you know. Yeah. They're going to kick aside yeah. so fast, we are not going to be able to blink, you know. So it's, I think it's very important to, 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 to make those rules, little adjustments that doesn't hurt the sport itself or the nature of the weapon, but to make that adjustment. And also let's go back to, for a second to, to David's suggestion, which I absolutely agree with the, the commentating. Commentating is a very, very important thing. And I think FIE started doing this many years ago, but unfortunately there are the two main characters not so excited about things that's happening on the strip. Now, lately, they started bringing in a professional 
mm. actual athletes. But myself, I'm uh, at the venues also, and they're hunting people to try to find somebody for the finals to come, right? Now, sometimes they find somebody decent, sometimes not. Sometimes the person doesn't really speak English well and can't give it back how it's supposed to happen. I think they, they, they should try to hire somebody. Like, I think they uh, had Iris Zimmerman traveling to uh, to Doha to a Grand Prix, like uh, last year or a year before. And I, I know she was a fencer, first of all, right? So she knows what's going on, even if she was a full fencer. But she called me. She called the other national coach, Andre Geva, and gathered information. Who's, who are the guys we should watch? What are they doing? What's going on here? Let me get prepared for this. So she prepared herself for this job because she wasn't just picked out of the crowd of fencers who lost already. Let's come help us out. They actually prepared her for this or gave her time to prepare for herself to do this commentating. And obviously she can. She did a really good job, I think, and... And that's the way they should do it, you know. Yeah, yeah. Maybe somebody who is not competing, but competed before, maybe retired, travel him over there or her, and then have the person be prepared and and do this almost like a professional job, you know, with some pay and then travel. Obviously, it costs some money, but I think if you want to do it better, then we have to go this way. Yeah, the FA does yeah, have I, some I people. Certainly- on payroll, Sorry. like Iris, and uh, I think Jeff Buchanan's another one who occasionally traveled to tournaments and, and, and fill that role that you're talking about. But go ahead, Alex. Yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to disparage the commentators who do it. <clears throat> you know, they're probably not getting a lot of money for it, and they they do it because they love fencing. So that, that they should be applauded for that. Um, but I want to go back to the example of MMA. You guys, you guys have watched all watched some MMA. I never do, but. Right. All right, I know what, what it is. I know uh, what it is. Usually in the UFC, they have two commentators. They have this guy named Mike Goldberg and Joe Rogan. And they're very different personalities. Mike Goldberg is like your standard hype man. Like, he gets overly excited about most things that happen. He has very little. He started to get better, but for a while, he had, like, no technical knowledge of what was going on. And he would just be like, oh, my goodness. Like, whatever. Just getting excited about every, like, every moment was the most exciting moment he had ever had. And... <laughs> Um, yeah. Joe Rogan was the guy when the fighters were like on the ground doing their Brazilian jiu-jitsu who was like trying to explain some of the nuanced people and, and giving giving credit to the guy when he did something really technically amazing or whatever. But and then and then when, when someone would get knocked out or submit or whatever, they would both just go totally nuts. And I think I totally agree with the idea that um, like the commentators are providing the energy of the environment or the, of the moment right and even something as simple as their tone when their tone is like like they're they're like falling asleep or not not super excited themselves how do they expect or how do we expect our audience to become excited too and um i do think you need someone who understands the the nuance of the weapon and i think that's something that's maybe they're starting to recognize because say we have like I'm going to drone on. We have the uh, world championship final between Marcus and uh, Marcus Mepstead and Enzo Lafour, right? And if you look at this match, there's a whole story. You have like Marcus, who has this very classical defense where he's going to keep his point right out in front of him and he's, he's going to punish you for making like big preparations and things like that. And you have Enzo, who all day has been running at people with his arm back, coming at them with these changing lines, these big, crazy ways. And so there's like, there's a good style matchup to be told. And then, you know, Enzo in the past has had tons of trouble with this fencer, Cheremisinov, who has this great counterattack he keeps using every time Enzo makes these big preparations. So you could tell a whole story about how the bout between these two fencers is going to be really interesting because we're going to see Marcus is shorter than Cheremisinov. So is, it, is, he, is he going to be able to play the same, same kind of game and, you know, all this stuff? And then you have some other guy who's just, or a girl, who's totally nuts, just going crazy about everything that happens, getting super excited. I feel like then you have the recipe for, like, an exciting um, experience at the fencing strip or watching the bout. And, yeah, it depends totally on, like, yeah, the schedule has to be good, the live feed has to be good, all those things have to happen. Those are a given, right? We're, it's like 2020, we should be able to do that by now. Um, yeah. But I look, I look less at the... X is like the equipment of the sport and the, you know, scoring and stuff like that. I don't think people 
I don't think that's, I think they learn that. I don't think that's what makes them, like, bite or not bite. I turn on archery. Me and Kelly started watching archery yesterday, first time ever. Olympic archery final. We watched the whole individual and whole team. I got it. I figured it out. I didn't understand the rules when it started. I, you know, we paid attention. We figured it out. We didn't need, I don't know. I I just don't think you need, I think the people figure it out after the fact. I think you need good personalities and buzz and a story. You need to generate interest and hook people, and then that stuff can come later. So I think I but think. Cor- Cor- can I ask Cornell a question? Oh, I'm gonna ask you a question after that. Yeah. <clears throat> all right, all right, no, no, no. Go I go. You go first. You go first. Okay. So basically, uh, my question is because it always frustrates me, right? Like, I've been involved in fencing for uh, over forty years, and I'm coaching for like thirty, right? I went through a lot of like rule changes or trying to change the rules. I, I went through like saber when they counted the simultaneous actions, right? It was crazy, <laughs> let's say. Or we fenced like a 10 touch bat or two out of three fives, winning by two, winning by one, whatever. That's not the point. The point is what frustrates me many times in foil as much as I got to tell you guys, I love high level, any kind of fencing, okay? Me, the saber me foil, too. I pay for me, it doesn't matter. I watch it. I love it. But what frustrates me, especially in foil, I got to tell you that if I'm, a, let's say, a completely outsider and I have, okay, Olympic finals, let's say Nick Itkin in the top four and maybe Racing Bowden in the top four. I'm totally outside that. I want to watch it. I sit down. Oh, let me, let me just beforehand, I have two hours. Let me just look up the rules so I know something about it, right? I open the rule book and I, I see what's going on. And I go watch the actual match, and I'm like, what? I, I, I don't understand. I totally lose it because I don't understand if this is what it is called an attack in the rule book, why is it not called the same way in the actual bat? And I understand you guys and the coaches, they say, and I agree with that, this is how the referees call it. So this is how I have to teach. Of course, that's your job to make sure your, your student wins. And, and this is how you teach it. Go with your arm back, doesn't matter. Just that eventually you're hitting, then you're good. But for an outsider, it's just a total mess, basically. Yeah. Because they're not following the rules. I, w- I would love to see just simplify it and say, okay, whoever is taught going forward is an attacker. Although the rule book doesn't say that. But if it would, I know it's harder to adjust the rule book than the refereeing, but it should be some kind of. Uh, compromise where we we getting closer one to the other so people can understand it easier. I, you know, com- what do you think I, I completely that? agree. Um, can, I, can I just say something quickly? Yes, yeah, yeah. go. The, like, the most annoying thing for me as a referee is um, a coach who doesn't like know that much about fencing but knows everything about the rules. And like... You. <laughs> this no... I'm, I'm still here, Andrew. I, I'm still here. And um, the coach will will be like, like it, it'll be a very obvious attack counterattack say, and the coach will say, like, oh, but he didn't. He he started his attack with his arm behind a 135 degree angle, and like, <laughs> I'm like, how do you know? Did you check with a protractor? But like in the rules, technically he's right. Like that's not an attack. But as a referee, we don't care about that stuff. And the rules definitely need to change to reflect the conventions. And maybe if we adhere to that a little more closely in Sabre, we wouldn't get a new trend every couple months. And, you know, it, people would actually understand some of what was going on. But Well, okay. I fear that I'm going to start World War Three if we get into an argument about the extension of the arm and the attack in preparation. Oh, do that. All, that, all that stuff. And I... Uh, I'm a pacifist for now in that respect. So <laughs> what I will say is, like, I'm Canadian, right? And I, um, when I moved to the U.S., I had seen American football probably three, like, I had actually sat down and watched a football game probably three times in my life. And I did it because I went to uh, my university's team games, and it was just fun to watch people I knew playing. And I would cheer for them, and it was fun for me. But um, I didn't know anything about the rules. And what was amazing to me is how every single person that I talked to understood every single nuance of the rules. Like anybody could explain to me why exactly this was a, like same thing with like, I think almost any sport, the fans of the sport have a good grasp of the rules. Now, Cornell, your point is like, there's a disparity between 
what the rules actually say and how they're applied. And I can't give you an example because I don't actually know if there are other sports in similar situations. But I do think that um, the conventions are not any harder to learn than the actual rules. So I think that with a good, like you Yoda did that more enjoy fencing thing. And I thought he gave a good enough rundown. Like I thought it was very good, uh, very good summary of basically what the rules are. And once you have the basic skeleton, like of what the rules are, when it would help, like you said, okay, you're moving forward, you're attacking at least some simplicity and then kind of deal with the nuanced cases. Like a little bit later as people get to know the sport, I don't know. I just don't know that that's the barrier. I think that's a barrier for an epic fencer to watch foil. Because they're like, this is ridiculous. This guy's pulling his arm back, getting hit, and then hitting the other person. How does this make any sense? But that's because you fence epic, and the time is very short that you have. <laughs> and, like, your understanding is totally different. But for a total layperson, I feel like they, they, don't, they don't come in with that understanding of time being so short like mm-hmm. it is in epic. So they, and in Saber to some extent. So, like, they're a little, maybe a little more accepting of these, like, general, okay, he's got the ball, he's holding the ball, he's trying to hit the guy and he fell short, he doesn't have the ball anymore. What, like it, what, what, do, you, what do you think, you're just, I, I know it's not going to change anything, yeah, okay? yeah. But, but when I'm looking at it, and uh, don't worry, I can, I, I can stay pretty calm and you're not going to start World War Three here, <laughs> but what I don't really understand in this, like, somebody starts going forward, okay? Arm back or point here or point there. But all of a sudden, another guy extends and makes a lunge. Why cannot that be called an attack against this? It would simplify everything. This is everything what happens. So this is why World War III is going to get started. This is why we're going to have World War III, because every single instance is a little bit different, right? Did it happen right at the beginning of his step? Did it happen while his blade was moving backwards? Did it happen towards the end of his step? Like, there's so much... There's so much um, but we have the great two tool. actors in every situation. We have the great tool right? of video, and they can look at it. Well, I think so. You know, I think that um, I think that I think that that kind of brings it back to what I was saying at the beginning. And ultimately, I think the giant barrier for our sport comes down to subjectivity versus simplicity. Right? Mm-hmm. Again, you know, football. All right, the rules are very black and white. They're very cut and dry, unless you're playing the Patriots. Um, but yeah, the, the, the main idea. World War III. Speaking of World War Three, <laughs> the main idea is that the football goes from this end of the field to that end of the field, and if it happens, it's a point. Now, there's a lot of complicated stuff that goes on in there, but the ultimate goal is very simplistic, and what you guys are talking about is the subjectivity of our sport, which, you know, forget about being frustrating from a coach's standpoint or from a fencer's standpoint, but as, you know, as Cornell said, if I sit down and I read this complex manual, because if I know nothing about fencing and I read the rules, it's going to be a complex manual. Mm-hmm. But if I'm interested in enough to go through that effort that I sit down an hour before and then I sit down after doing an hour of homework and the teacher comes up and says, you did the wrong homework. I'm just going to be like, well, I'm not just going to watch this. I'm going to go eat a pizza or something. And then I turn it off and I walk away. Right. And so that's part of the problem. And again, it just comes back, you know, a lot, a, a lot of, a lot of the older generation, they're they're all very big traditionalists, right? They're purists as far as what fencing is supposed to be, and it makes. Talking it... about Cornell? <laughs> no, I was talking about Andrew. <laughs> but um, but it's it's it makes it very difficult to make any kind of change. And I'm the same way. I don't want to see, for example, uh, the strategical element of fencing dumbed down because we want to make it more spectator friendly and i think ultimately if you look at making something as complex as foil or saber or even epe i you know i think i don't know anything about epe but i think that there's still a strategical element in that too and i think that if you look at changing that stuff then you're changing the core of the sport starting a project like if that is going into next season to make this to start on the road being more spectator friendly to bring it 
to the mainstream media, so to speak, I think that you you have to have regular broadcast. There's zero excuse in our day and age of technology not to have easily accessible live streams and then videos, right? It's, it's just, it's simple, it's easy. You got to stick to it. But then you also have to have the personalities. You have to have the commentators. You have to have someone pushing it. You know, it's like, Andrew, you know this about, you know, growing your YouTube channel is that it's about interacting with people. Mm -hmm. And that interaction is what grows the interest. It creates relationships. And that's what keeps people coming back. So that's a full-time job. Yeah. And if you've got people who are commentating doing that, then they need to be the ones, you know, pushing it too. And, 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 and again, it creates this whole other job opportunity. Um, but I think, you know, you guys are right. It's something that needs to be addressed because as other sports, you know, gain traction and steam on social media and things like that, you know, we don't want fencing to fall by the wayside because we can't be bothered to find exciting personalities or we can't be bothered to agree on, you know, simplistic rules for the sport so that other people can gain an interest. And, and I think ultimately that's what it comes down to is kind of the longevity of our sport. Mm. So I, just to change gears completely, one of the things that, that I think makes fencing hard for people to like follow in the long term is the fact that um, you can't see anyone's face while they're competing. Because in a lot of other sports, people, uh, people like they see the personality of the person and they can connect it with someone's face. But for us, it, it's kind of, it's kind of like, uh, swimming when someone is face down in the water, you can't see them. And so it becomes harder to like identify with the person. And so in about like Alex was talking about with, uh, Curatoli and Zalamir, where they kept taking their masks off and they're showing a lot of personality, like bouts like that get a lot of hype yeah. and not just because of the drama, <laughs> because like you can see their face a bit. And I think this, this is a very radical stance, especially for a referee to take. But I think that one of the reasons, uh, one of the things that we can do to make uh, people more interested is have a short period of time between the touches where people are allowed to take their masks off. And I mean, that's, that's certainly going to make it more spectator friendly. The FIE sort of realized this a while ago when they tried to introduce the visor mask, which they re redacted for safety reasons. But like, that was a good first step to make people's faces more visible. And I mean, there's other ways to do that besides adding the visor mask. You don't have to require the mask to be on every single second, but there could be like a, sh a sh like a shot clock type thing, like maybe ten seconds between well, each touch where you're allowed to take your mask off and do whatever you want. Not whatever you want, but I, mean, I, I wonder if you could mitigate that need because I totally agree. You got to see the people's faces, but is there a way? If Saber, maybe you just do it. Maybe you extend the one minute break. I don't know. Like I'm, is it could it be mitigated by? Like in the only in the finals or the semifinals of the World Cups, like in, in almost every one on one combat sport, there is a pre and post fight interview, mm -hmm. right? Of some some kind. And it's caught it's highlighted. Is there a way to mitigate that by having those two things? Because I think that would be really cool, by the way. Yeah. Or um, potentially maybe in the saber it would be fine you have this one minute break you know is going to happen right it's going to happen every single bout at eight mm -hmm. that that's extended and everybody and each competitor like says something to the camera or so i don't know but i think that's stupid because it's uh, not stupid but I, I don't like it because it's messing with the flow of the fencing bout um but i'm thinking back to some really exciting bouts that i watched some of them were for the fencing but like uh to use an example that most of us like in the American fencing community are familiar with when the very first time um, last season when Miles and Nick uh, Itkin fenced for the very first time, there was a huge crowd, right? Yeah, there was there a was lot a of hype. Story. And I can imagine, like, what if the day before we knew that was going to happen or like an hour before we knew that bout was going to happen and you got Miles on the camera talking about how, how, he, how he thought the bout was going to go and what was going to happen and all this stuff. And then you had Nick. They're two totally different personalities. Like, yeah, they are. It, it would be very, I think, um, th that was a really, like, more people watched that bout than watched the final, I think. Because um, there was a little bit oh, of definitely. a story behind it. And I, I remember trying to watch it, and I'm short, right? So I'm, like, asking Sean, like, what just happened? <laughs> because I, I can't see over all these people who came to watch the bout. It was crazy. Yeah, I, um, I actually was refing at the time. Something, right? we, have, we can't be dumb to that, like... 
Yeah, I, I was refing at the time, and I knew that bat was going to be super hyped, so I actually bribed someone and gave them my camera and had them go film it for me, so. Yeah, and, and like, like I just think we, we, we have to leverage those kinds of situations, and we, like I said, we have some, I'm sure, I was going to ask Cornell, like, can you give me, my question for you was like, can you give me an example of a bout between two people? Like, Curtis can be, like, polarizing, right? People <laughs> yeah, are yeah. like, people hate it or they love it, yeah. right? They hate it or they love it. Sometimes both at the, the same time. <laughs> And, and like, so is there, when there, there, there's, let's say about between, and I, I, I think this, these kinds of people are good for fencing and we kind of chase them away because we're like, oh, it's not, you know, this isn't acceptable conduct as we deem it acceptable. But Cornell, can you give me like a bout between two epi fencers that I don't know and say, this is what this guy's like. This is what this guy's like. This, these are their styles. And like, and I bet you, can, I guess... I know you can, and you can yeah. get me excited about watching Epe, and I would be so Absolutely. much more interested in the bout than if I watched it myself right now. Like, Absolutely. I, I want to go back for a second to what Andrew started talking about, and then we were actually talking about this uh, taking the mask off, right? Now, in Epe, it actually happens a lot, okay? And uh, I think it happens a lot and easier than in foil and saber because many times, I think by the... I'm not sure exactly what the wording of the rule is, but I think it's mostly before the referee makes any decision, you can't take a mask off, right? And since Epe is very straightforward, light is on, pretty much the decision was made, the touch is there, so many answers they're taking a mask off, and they're not getting penalized for that. For not in four, five occasions, then the referee says, okay, mask, 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 right? But I think uh, they let it go pretty well in Epi. And I think uh, also that, uh, obviously, we, we like to say, and a lot of people like to say, fencing is gentleman's sport, right? White sport, gentleman's sport, right? Which we have the referee and you follow the orders no matter what. But I also think that to some extent, we should let get things a little more hyped, you know? I would like to see even the... When the, when the coach comes in and starts yelling, arguing with the referee a little bit, every sport has that, guys. Mm -hmm. Basketball, they throw in a the coach is throwing a chair on the <laughs> court. You know, I'm not saying we have to do that, but the little bit letting that happen, it More creates drama. a little excitement. Mm -hmm. You know, not obviously. I'm a coach, and I, I know a lot of coaches, and I know coaches, and I know myself. I can do this pretty well without literally attacking the referee as you are an idiot or you don't know what you're talking about, right? You can word it well enough to make an argument and, and make it good argument and uh, make it exciting for the spectators of, look, the coach is arguing, the coach is not agreeing, but the coach is not cursing at the referee. The coach is still uh, understanding the referee is trying to do his, his job the best he can, but of course, everybody can make a mistake. So I, I should have a room to some extent to argue, just like the fencer or the referee to speak to me, it would bring a little more excitement to it, you mm -hmm. know, instead of just, okay, on guard, on guard. Now, many times I see it in the World Cups, my guy scoring the touch or receiving the touch and walks a little bit back, you know, before he comes back to the on guard line, the referee comes up on guard. When I say on guard, you got to be on guard. And it feels like, feels like sometimes it's like a horse race, you know, get to the line, get to the line, ready fence, ready fence. It's, it's not right. I understand we have to get things moving and we have a schedule and whatever, but to get on somebody's butt and tell him to get in on guard, get in on guard, get in on guard all the time That's in like a few seconds, right? uh, I don't like that. You know, even Sabre, they walk well, around a little bit, the they put the, to put the, time, right? yeah, you need that little time. Yeah, yeah exactly. You know? We don't we don't have the chance to think during during like the action that that happens in Epe and Foil because just like that time doesn't exist. Like if I don't yeah. if I don't have a good idea of what I'm gonna do when I get on guard, you're lo like Absolutely. unless you're incredibly reactive, you're usually gonna lose the touch. And then once the actual like the movement starts, I'm doing everything based on feeling. Like there's no time to think. If there if I'm if I'm thinking about something, I'm probably getting hit. So, th I mean, th there there are tricks that you you tell your students. I'm sure David to like tie your shoe, fix your hair, do things between the touches to get yourself time to like process the information and think. But I, I think no, I'm, I'm a complete straight shooter. 
I knew. I, I respect. I, mean, I respect that about you. Um, I think one of the best tricks. One of the best. Tricks, follow the rules, guys. Come on. <laughs> one of the best tricks, what not so many people using yet, uh, actually, is, I think, and I never seen. I, I know a guy who does this a lot. I'm not gonna name him, but he does it a lot and never got caught for it. Okay. So basically, he stops at the on guard line and he waves the referee. Can you please come here? I have a question. Okay, and the referee's like, "Oh, sure. What's up?" You know, and obviously the question is kind of bullshit. <laughs> to some extent, makes sense, but you know, Mario, it's you really just to breed, you know. Yeah. But the referees Buy yourself get some time. pissed. Yeah. Exactly. But the referees they don't get pissed, and, and oh, this, this. Okay, thank you. On guard. And they're not using it enough, but it's a really good move, I think, <laughs> yeah. and and doesn't piss the referee off. Not gonna turn against you, and still buying some time to think and then and, and catch your breath you know well i think it's interesting you know what you were talking about earlier and, and everybody's kind of touched on this to some degree about the drama yeah, i'm reminded of a conversation i had with a friend you know i'm in the south and there's a lot of people here that love nascar i don't get it but i asked one of my friends one time i said come on man like they're just going in a circle they're turning left do you leave come back an hour later they're still turning left like What's exciting? Uh, He's like, oh, no, I don't watch it for that. I watch it for the crashes. And I'm like, okay. Well, and, you know, while there's not necessarily a degree of a, a crash and fencing, you do want to have those personalities come through. And I think that the personalities are what will offset that not being able to see the face. I think that being able to see the face of the woman at break is good. You know, you can you can see the face. You can see, oh, they're flustered or, oh, you know, they've, they're in control or they have an idea or they don't have an idea. And it kind of gets you excited to see the second half of the bout. But, you know, there's just not really anything that we can do. Uh, sorry, not really anything that we can do to alleviate that during the bout. Unless we just want them to fence without masks, which is not really a thing. Um, <laughs> but, you know, the, having the personalities in there, having these interviews, and you do that with specific people. When you have the specific people that you know are good, you know, personalities, you know to go watch their bouts. And, and that's something that you guys touched on earlier, too. When Iris was out doing the commentating, she, she asked, you know, what fencers do I need to be watching out for? What matchups should I be looking for? And when you get into, you know, when you get into the top 16 of any Grand Prix or any Senior World Cup, you know who's going to be fencing who, you know top 64 etc etc might be a little bit of a crapshoot but for the most part top 16 top 8 top 4 it's all the same people hey can you hush i'm trying to do very important interviews (laughs) thanks some more milk god this kid um but you know that's just how it goes and i it's you know the thing is i think there are so many good ideas out there uh from a lot of different people i just think it takes people willing to pursue them Mm -hmm. because it's not going to be easy and it's not you know there's not it's not going to be magic and i think that that and andrew again you know this with the youtube when you start your youtube you you don't make videos and the next day you have a thousand subscribers right you're making videos and talking to nobody but you got to do the videos and pretend like you're talking to everybody Mm -hmm. so you got to be willing to put in the work and put in the the you know, the effort, um, and trust that the result will come later down the road, just like we tell our fencers all the time. Yeah. Um, it's like building a foundation. Are, yeah. And I think, I think that's what people are looking for is <laughs> they're looking for this like instant, you know, this instant solution, like, okay, we're going to broadcast it. And then we're going to be on ESPN. Like, no, you're going to be on the Ocho, man. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, I hate <laughs> I hate when you when something is done and they're like, oh well, ESPN didn't want to like pick it up, so that was a bad idea. But like, y- you you can't like you were just saying, you can't expect that to work the first time. You need to have a little consistency, yeah. and then maybe that'll happen in the future. No, no, then definitely it'll happen in the future. But it needs to be done well, and it needs to be done consistently, and then we'll start you know getting picked up by things like that. So right. So what do then, you guys think about, you know how in the NCAA format they allow these timeouts? They do that, they, I'm assuming they do that in all three weapons. I don't know yes. anything about the... Yeah, so, but not at the championships. Just at the let's, dual meets. Let's say specifically in Sabre, because it makes maybe a little more sense to be in Sabre than it does in Foil and Epe. 
we have our breaks. We usually if about, I mean, we get the break at three minutes, so it's it makes some sense. But but with the with the arbitrary decision that at eight we're going to have a break for a minute in saber, is it interesting to have timeouts? Yes, instead? I think that's interesting. Like rather than having a break at eight. Yeah, I think if each if each coach could call like I don't know two 30 second timeouts in about I think that would be really interesting that's a great idea it was then, kind of intriguing right because like let's say you get hit with this one trap from ready fence and your coach is like oh we talked about that that's that's the thing he's gonna do all the time so they're like timeout timeout remember we talked about that you're supposed to do this you're supposed to be looking for this so like whatever maybe that would be like it would add more uh it would give the air even if it didn't of more strategy being done and like make it a little more intriguing oh we made that adjustment after the timeout or whatever yeah no, I I think that's awesome. I mean, I've I've won or lost bouts after after being way up in a college bout or way down because a timeout was called. What do you think about that, David? I think that would affect us the most of all of them. What's that? Sorry, I was cleaning vomit off my arm. <laughs> um, Alex let was me, saying. Let me, let me say something. Let me say something. So basically, we were talking about timeouts, and I I think it's a great idea because maybe not too much, but imagine a saber bat. You do have the break at eight, okay? That's one minute, right? And then both sides can call one minute timeout, okay? So now, it's three minutes. You have break basically, where and maybe you can even enforce it. You must call that timeout because then you can put some commercials in. Now I know I'm speaking in a real American here from, our side, <laughs> but that's part of to be able to televise it, to give some commercial. Yeah, put your Red Bull ad in there. That's great. Right. <laughs> Whatever. No, I think that that's, I Whatever, think that's but... an interesting thing, uh, an interesting point. I, You know, I could just, it would definitely change the flow and the rhythm of the bouts. Yeah. And it could make for some interesting moments. Um, I, I, I could tell you that as a, as a as a coach, I'm already thinking, oh, how would I use that one minute to mess up with you know mess with my opponent or, or something yeah, yeah. like that? So that could it's, be part of it. You know, it, it, it's it, that's part of it, and, I, and that goes into the gamemanship and the showmanship. And I think that you know, I, it's really interesting. I, I have a, I trained with a, a guy up here up here in Atlanta who fought in the UFC, and I was asking him about. Um, I was asking him about, you know, they have those press conferences where, you know, they weigh in and then they get in each other's face and they're like, oh, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And I was like, yeah, what's that like to like have to fight somebody and be in the same room as them and have them talking that much smack? And he leaned in real close and he goes, dude, it's all bullshit. I was like, what do you mean? He goes, we're all best friends. We're just generating hype for the fight. We want that paycheck. And so I think that... You know, I, I think that that's just again that comes down to the personality aspect, and and I think adding adding time out definitely definitely mix things up in an interesting way. Yeah, because Saber is the point. only one. That's what I was thinking about. I was thinking about that all, like all week when we were waiting to do this. I was like, man, these guys in MMA they talk so much smack about each other, and I mean it's not like Mike Tyson level, but it gets to be pretty bad sometimes. Yeah. And, I, and then they hug each other when the fight's over. And I'm yep. always looking at it, I'm like, this guy just knocked you out cold and you're giving him a hug. Like, this is crazy. But that shows that we don't, in fencing, necessarily have to be like, like, can you imagine the most boring pre-fight interview ever? Is like, my opponent's very skilled. He works very hard. It will be a good match. <laughs> and both people say right. that. It's like, come on. Honestly, <laughs> that's, that's kind of what every pre-tennis match interview is like. It's like, oh yes, he's very talented. He hits, he hits great forehands and backhands. I'm gonna yeah. try to like beat him you, as best I can. I think it all ties together with this incentive of maybe advertising dollars or something like that. And that's why it's the structure of the tournaments maybe is an issue. Maybe it needs to be more like tennis for that to be possible. Like it needs to be more like this person versus this person or something, um, because it, it is a little bit harder when so many people are involved in things like that. But if you could somehow relate the popularity of the event to like the athletes meaning that when they hype up the event like they like they get pay-per-view some of the best athletes in boxing for example will get a percentage of the pay-per-view buys right mm -hmm. so they know that when they get up there and try to hype it up that they're getting they're getting something for it so that would be totally outrageous 
Um, <laughs> and we don't have that. So there's less incentive for them to do that. But I think, I think we, again, I keep coming back to, we have great personalities. I'm sure you guys, I don't know anything about Sabre and Epe, but um, there are some people in foil where if you just explain to them, like, look, we're trying to, we're trying to hype this up. Can you two pretend you hate each other? Can you be like, I know he's going to come forward with his blade in this position and try to hit me like this, and I'm so ready for it. Like, well, I got 10 things I can do when he tries to do his favorite thing. You know, whatever. Like, I feel like I would want to watch. That's why I was thinking when I was asking you, Cornell, or, and, but I could do it in Sabre, too. Like, I want to – well, maybe we should do an experiment, but – um, I, I, I want to see what that's like in Epe. Like, I, I, as a spectator, give me about to watch. Tell me about the two fencers. Tell me about, you know, some history and their style. And, and have it, I just think, like, I don't know, I'm just repeating myself. But that's how we get it. That's how we make a boat exciting. It's yeah. not, it's not, it's never going to be because the little visor lets you see their face or the lockout yeah. time is a little bit of this, a little bit of that. The context and the presentation. Cornell, I still think Cornell had a great idea, which is the elephant in the room. Just like, you know, there's, we have to look at all, everything that goes into what sells an event. Um, and I, I won't, won't get, I don't want to ruin your idea, but uh, we, we, we have to, I just think we don't want to, we have to look at all these sports and what they have that, um, and the various reasons why people tune into them and how we can how we can emulate them i think it's also a good idea what you mentioned earlier alex the the pre and post game interviews even when you watch like a big tennis tournament they catching the guys or the girls walking out in the corridor from the locker room every time and just few few words you know two three questions what do you expect what's uh, how was your preparation or your rest before the ga- match yeah. or whatever what did you do last night or whatever and then we, we should definitely have that you know i'm i'm, I'm I'm pretty sure we can't have it right away every tournament, but at World Championships and Olympics, they should definitely have that. A short Kelly suggested, what do you guys think? Of, the top four, you know. Kelly suggested uh, entrance music. <laughs> I don't oh, think God. They, they do that sometimes. They do have. They do have. No, but the athletes don't like choose that. it, right? Oh, oh yeah, 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 yeah. That's, That's true. True. a good point. That's true. Athletes could submit. They okay. This is what I want when I'm come. If I make the top four and you introduce me, this is the music I want. That's that's a cool idea, I think. You show it would be Metallica for me, that's for sure. <laughs> well, I'm a little old, man. <laughs> yeah, I can pay somebody to play my music, you know. <laughs> and, yeah. But it's a good idea to have that music. And I think that the pre- and post-interviews definitely should be a must, you know. And actually, actually hold on for a second. They they do that kind of stuff. They not. I don't think they televise it, but I've seen that on YouTube. And I remember at, at Worlds in China... They definitely do those uh, post interviews right away. Mm. I'm not sure who did it. I think it was just FIE, and they put that on YouTube right away. Or it was live on YouTube, but they definitely did the uh, post. Uh, I really like. They're making some really good, really good steps, but it's all so like vanilla, I guess. It's all so like where everything's positive, everything's this, everything. Like there's no, there's no controversy or like element of drama to it. That's why. I, and the, the best thing they did that was had a little bit of that was that club challenge. There was a little bit of people playing off each other, talking smack to each other, and I watched every single one of those because it was fun. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. It's I mean, it's just about creating a show and creating a show that people are going to watch and want to watch, and then come back and watch, and then tell their friends, "Hey, you know, I mean, like ultimately." You know, the best thing in the world would be, I mean, could you imagine people all around, you know, the nation having viewing parties for world championships the way they do the Super Bowl? Like, I mean, it would be awesome. Um, But there's obviously there's a long way to go before we get there. We just need people to know what fencing is. Yeah. Um, Yeah. But I think I think that I think that the the first step and the, the, the main goal should be creating an entertaining show. Um, and, and doing that in such a way that it doesn't detract from the sport itself. Um, cause I can think of, I, and I can already think of a couple of fencers off the top of my head who I have, who, you know, if they did a pre bout interview for the top four, they would just absolutely tank it. Like <laughs> then just go, ah! and that would be it. Like I would just, I would just be like, oh God, please, please <laughs> don't put this on anything. Um, so it's, you know, it's, 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 um, 
I think that I think that there are appropriate places to do that with uh, certain athletes, uh, and and again, there are personalities in which you know U.S. fencing could play off of more or less. Um, and I think that there are people who are well suited to do the commentating and the announcing, and and, and it's just about you know all of the pieces are there. Fencers. We are unique individuals. There's a reason we chose fencing and not another mainstream sport, all right? We're just not – we're just a little off the beaten path. And that is um, – that that makes for entertainment value in of itself. And I think that it's just about taking the pieces that are there and putting them into a coherent package so that, you know, we can bring it to the general public. We can take it to people who don't know anything about fencing – but they look at it, they go, this guy is really entertaining. I can't wait to see this guy argue a touch that is very clearly not his. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, and so I, you just, you need somebody in charge of that. Now, I don't know, you know, I don't, I don't know who does that or, you know, whatever, but it's, it's definitely going to be all about the production value. I think that the pieces are there. You guys watch those, uh, there's some old video on YouTube. It's not that old, but like, Say early '90s. Um, if you watch the videos of tournaments that happened in France, the commentators are incredibly biased. Like it's hilarious. It really. It's like like there's a call against a French guy, and the both commentators are like, "Are you serious?" Like that was. I, at least I speak French. Uh, unfortunately, I don't speak any other languages, so I can't speak for other uh, commentary. But the French stuff is hilarious. It's like, really, it's like that was attack and preparation. The Italian got the benefit of the referee's bad call. Blah blah blah. Like everything is. And, it, and it, but they're, they're but they're speaking to their audience, right? And they they get the crowd now is like, oh, the French guy's the underdog. Like uh, he's got to get, you know, got to get seventeen touches to win, kind of thing. And I, I enjoyed that at first. I was like, this is weird. <laughs> like the commentators aren't supposed to be like this. Yeah. But after a while, I was like, this is making it more fun. <laughs> I think that's part of the advantage of having it like be less mainstream is that you can get away with stuff that's not as like politically correct or whatever. Um, yeah. it, it, it used to be the same way in, uh, in melee before it became like a huge esport. Like you'd have people just like screaming and like cursing on the commentary and it, it made it much more hype than people who like are like very sterile and are like talking about it in like a very controlled way. Even if they're getting excited, it, it doesn't have like the same feeling. I don't know. Right. Yeah. But yeah, it, at, a, at a certain point, if you want people to take the sport more seriously, you have to get rid of that. But like right now, let's let's just like get people into the sport, and then we can worry about that later. Yeah, so. I mean, there's a line, right? Like there's a point where it gets to total absurdity. Yeah. But I I just I think back. There's been so many great moments in like individual bouts where um, everyone watching was like, "Oh my god, did you see that?" Like I don't know what happened, but Miles and uh, Siddharth were fencing at like I think it was December or January, and. I think Siddharth landed parapost to Miles back, and some guy in the audience like went crazy, and Miles noticed it. He was like looking at this guy who was yelling like crazy, and he was like, "Who is this guy?" And then he scored. A really, I can't remember what he did, but he scored a really flashy touch on Siddharth, and he just looked right at that guy and like screamed right at that guy. And everyone was like, everyone after the bell was like, "Oh, do you remember when that happened?" Well, it was it was a total it's a total spectacle. It had nothing to do with like fencing, but. That's what I mean. Like everyone was talking about it. Like it was a funny. I, we got to embrace that stuff. We don't want to chase those people away. Yeah, totally. Right? 